artificial heavy fermion superconductor. It's a completely different field, but it shows how these methods can be applied uh, in any other kind of direction as well. So let me start first uh, with the bottom-up design of a topological superconductor in a two-dimensional magnet uh, superconductor hybrid system uh, hosting chiral Majorana H modes. And uh, this uh, was motivated by a theory uh, publication here back in 2016 by the Princeton Group. They have proposed that if you uh, grow a ferromagnetic island with an out-of-plane magnetization on an S-wave superconductor, and they propose to use lead, then you should be able to uh, look at Majorana uh, modes. These are chiral Majorana modes here at the periphery of this island, and should not be mixed up with the Majorana zero modes as end states in quasi-one-dimensional systems, which have been, of course, uh, proposed earlier. So what's the difference of these chiral Majorana edge modes compared to the Majorana zero modes? Uh, in fact, uh, these Majorana uh, modes here showing up in quasi two-dimensional systems have a dispersion like this. So this shows energy as a function of wave vector. Uh, this is basically here the gap of your superconductor and you have here an edge mode which is dispersive. So you do not expect to see it just at firming level, but uh, of course uh, you should have a, a dispersion here, but you should only see this really at the periphery here, uh, whereas with Balak, and this means the interior of the island uh, should be gapped out. So uh, we wanted to look at uh, this uh, exciting uh, proposal from the experimental side, and, uh, uh, and it turned out that uh, the theory was interesting as a starting point and motivation. But uh, what was proposed, for instance, uh, using lead did not work out at all. Why is this? Because lead, as every surface scientist knows, uh, is a surfactant. And that means if you want to grow something like iron on top and a near the system, then the lead always would like to go on top. So that would never work. But that's the difference between theory and experiment. So uh, what you have to do is you have to choose a hybrid system where you are making sure that you can control the surface signs and the interface signs and simultaneously, of course, uh, getting into uh, a stage where you can really uh, check whether the theoretical predictions are correct. So we have uh, chosen uh, Rhenium 001, which is a superconductor with a transition temperature around 1.4 Kelvin. And then we have been growing epitaxially iron islands, as you can see here, monolayer iron islands here on top of this region 001. You can see here uh, basically that the iron sites, the iron atoms then occupy the hollow sites with respect to the region 001 lattice. And uh, uh, then you can have really a very nice epitaxial uh, iron island. Now if we uh, zoom into this uh, image, and this is an image uh, which has been recorded with scanning tonic microscopy, which is the right tool actually to address atomic scale structures, then we see here this part of the island uh, with this edge here now enlarged. And now what we can do with a scanning tonic microscope, as you all know, we can use it as a spectroscopic tool. That means that we can record the differential time conductance spatially resolved. And that gives us a measure of the local electronic density of states as a function of energy here, in that case, at the Fermi level of our sample system. And you see immediately that you do not only get here enhanced density of states at the edges, but you have a finite density of states also in the interior of the island. And that rules out basically that we have here a topological superconducting phase because uh, for a topological superconductor inside of the island, the interior of the island, uh, should uh, not show any density of states. And so this uh, was uh, of course a puzzle and then uh, we got help from theory from uh, Dave Moore and his colleagues in Chicago. And uh, they have been doing much more sophisticated uh, theoretical calculations than the early toy model used by the Princeton group. They have really done ab initio calculations to calculate the size of material parameters and use that as an input for type binding model calculations and even taking into account uh, the exact 
uh, shape of these islands uh, and then calculate what would be expected and you see indeed at Fermi Energy uh, we have here and the clear situation that we have a significant density of states inside the island ruling out that we have a topological superconductor. So uh, that's the first point what we should learn, uh, that uh, toy models can of course be used uh, for motivation, for doing certain experiments, but uh, the real world usually is much more sophisticated and you have uh, really to do uh, then uh, materials uh, engineering uh, to actually uh, get into the physics which you would like to look at. And so, of course, we did not give up here. There are a number of possibilities now to tune this system. And this is what I'm going to discuss next. So, what we can do is we can uh, use an interface engineering approach introducing an atomically thin oxide layer as a decoupling layer. And indeed, there is an oxygen uh, phase of this uranium. It's a two by one reconstruction. You see here the schematics uh, of this uh, two by one oxygen phase. And uh, since uh, this exhibits two fold symmetry and the underlying substrate is three fold symmetric, you can notice here that you have here these uh, oxide islands here in three uh, different rotational domains. Uh, so I've selected this particular scanning toy microscope image to show all three rotational domains. Uh, and um, on top of this uh, oxide layer, you can now grow again a model layer of iron epitaxy. You see, uh, you get a very nice uh, topography of this model layer iron island. And now, uh, if we zoom in into the structure model, we actually see that uh, uh, now the structure uh, is, of course, determined by the intermediate oxygen sites, which form this uh, two by one reconstruction. And the iron atoms now become uh, located above the rhenium sites. And this is a major difference. And theory shows that this is. Uh, the major point to drive this system into a topological superconducting phase. It's interestingly not the modified coupling between the iron layer and the rhenium substrate, which is of course also modified. Uh, the exchange coupling J is of course uh, very much different. But theory shows that this is uh, uh, the decisive uh, point when we change the registry of the iron lattice with respect to the rhenium lattice. And as a result, we clearly have now if you compare the topography with uh, now the spectroscopic data sets as a function of energy, a clearly modified situation compared to the iron islands in direct contact with rhenium. Now you see that the interior of uh, the island shows uh, basically zero density of states and there's only uh, state density at the periphery of the island at the Fermi level. And this is also so if you change the energy slightly above or below Fermi level, you still have a gap phase inside the island. Only if you approach then for coherence peaks of the superconductor, then of course the state density is also visible inside the island. And this was a wonderful agreement with uh, the theoretical calculations. So with the modified material parameters for this iron on oxygen on superconducting uranium, uh, Dick Morantis' group uh, was really successful uh, here to reproduce our experimental results. So they have calculated basically uh, the expected local density of states distribution as a function of energy here for this particular shape of the island. You can, you can see this wonderful agreement between experiment and view. So uh, that is the first example how you can uh, use uh, uh, atomic scale interface engineering uh, to actually uh, get into these topological superconducting phases, in this case for a two-dimensional system. Now what theory can and what uh, cannot be extracted directly from experiment, of course, uh, the theory uh, for this particular system uh, allows uh, to calculate, for instance, the churn number. Uh, here, the churn number which characterizes the topological phases occurring as a function of chemical potential and the coupling between the iron island and the rhenium substrate. And uh, you see here in a color coded fashion the churn number, and you see that for the material parameters derived from our initial calculations, we are actually here in the phase diagram, and this means we have churn numbers uh, typically on the order of 10 here for that system. 
And this shows basically the phase diagram uh, of a topological superconducting gap as a function of chemical potential and coupling between iron and uranium. And actually, uh, we extract for uh, this particular uh, material uh, hybrid system uh, a topological gap size on the order of 40 microEV. That's quite typical, as we will see later on, also for other systems. So it uh, was the first example which we uh, published about four years ago. But in the meantime, of course, we went uh, further and uh, actually looked into many other different kinds of systems. Now, as you all know, uh, in order to get uh, non-trivial uh, topological phases, it's uh, 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 advantages to have a high spin-orbit coupling. And uh, so we thought, uh, is it possible uh, to go into a direction where we increase spin orbit coupling? And the other motivation was, of course, is it possible uh, to use a superconducting substrate with a higher TC uh, than rhenium? Then we would be able to see in gap states more clearly. So if we look at the uh, uh, periodic table of elements here, uh, of course, we all know that uh, if we want to do uh, some nice design with an elemental superconductor uh, being superconducting under ambient pressure conditions, uh, we are basically left with these elements here. And uh, of course, if we want to have high spin orbit coupling, it's profitable to go for heavy, uh, 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 heavy systems, heavy metal systems here. Uh, so that's the reason why we have chosen rhenium. But as I said, the TC for rhenium is relatively low. So why not going for niobium, which has the largest TC among the elements on the order of 9.5 Kelvin. However, niobium is lighter than rhenium, for instance, and uh, uh, so you might wonder if you uh, have a sufficient uh, amount of spin orbit coupling uh, if you use niobium in these kind of hybrid systems. But again then, uh, the idea was to uh, create a novel kind of hybrid system which combines uh, this relatively large TC of niobium and large spin orbit coupling. So how are we going to do this? Uh, and uh, this is shown here. So we basically then create a hybrid structure of a fin film with very high spin orbit coupling on uh, niobium, for instance, with a relatively high TC. Of course, you can use other kind of high TC superconductors, maybe, but uh, I'll just show you now the basic principles. We have actually realized this by drawing a bismuth silver 2 alloy on silver 111 on niobium 110. And why is this? Because on one hand, it is known in surface science that you have a very nice epitaxial relationship between silver 111 and niobium 110, which is first cleaned really in such a way that you do not have any oxide layer on top. Then you can grow very nice uh, uh, silver 111 islands. We purposely created islands here. Um, with a size on the order of half a micron up to a micron. Of course, you can also uh, prepare closed films, but we had some other experiments in mind, which you will hear about later uh, uh, this morning. So we start off with single 111 and uh, islands of about one micron size. And for the STM, these are huge islands, so uh, uh, this is not a problem. If you then uh, grow one third of a monolayer of bismuth on top, and in the other system, then you can get an extremely nicely ordered bismuth silver 2 surface alloy. And this is an atomic resolution image of this uh, surface alloy. Uh, it exhibits a root 3 times root 3 structure. As you can see here, the bismuth sides are displayed here as pink sides and uh, the silver sides as uh, light gray sides here. And it is very well known that numerous groups have studied that system, for instance, with angry soil photo emission, and uh, this uh, surface exhibits an extremely large rush bar type spin orbit coupling. This is very well known. Now, we are not uh, do, doing up specimens, but we can extract such dispersions uh, also with the scanning tunneling microscope. So, what are we doing? We uh, actually uh, take large scale spectroscopic maps. Uh, at particular energies, as you can see here, and then we can Fourier transform these spectroscopic maps to get reciprocal space information. So you can nicely see here the six fold symmetric spots with relatively large k vectors here, which correspond to the atomic lattice, the hexagonal atomic lattice, uh, which I just showed you, 
in this large scale image, it's hard to see, or basically not possible to see the atomic structure, but the information is included, as you can uh, clearly see from this Fourier transform of uh, the raw data set here. But in addition, you see at uh, smaller k vectors, of course, also uh, spots here in the Fourier transform. And actually, uh, from this information, we can derive the scattering vectors uh, of these scattering states which show up in the spectroscopic map. And from this information, we can actually uh, determine these uh, green dots here uh, by analyzing these scattering vectors and reproduce basically uh, the dispersion of uh, these uh, bands of the silver bismuth 2 alloy. And uh, the green dots uh, extracted from the spe uh, scanning tonic spectroscopy maps are in wonderful agreement with the ARPAS data, uh, which uh, show up here in uh, red and in blue uh, lines. But of course, what cannot be done in, with ARPAS, and that's uh, of course, the advantage of using scanning talent spectroscopy, we can now go for much smaller energy scale and look whether this bismuth uh, silver 2 alloy is becoming superconducting by proximity to the uh, niobium substrate. So, uh, what you have here is basically now an atomic scale STM image. You see beautifully uh, the individual atoms here. Uh, we draw a line section here and do spectroscopic uh, measurements, meaning uh, we record the differential time conductance uh, then as a function of energy, and this is actually color coded here. And what you see here uh, as these uh, uh, red lines are basically uh, the signatures of the coherence peaks of the superconducting uh, bismuth silver 2 now, and you see this as a function of spatial coordinate, and this simply means that the superconductivity is homogeneous uh, down to the atomic level. Of course, we can do this also on large scales, uh, and this clearly proves that we have a spatially homogeneous superconducting phase of bismuth silver 2, and uh, the gap is basically determined to be 1.2 billion electron volts. Uh, this uh, should be compared with the gap size of, ni of niobium, which is on the order of 1.5 million electron volts. So we basically have achieved our goal of combining uh, now superconductivity and large scale optical coupling. And uh, why uh, is this now really of interest? And this is interest, of course, uh, in the field of topological superconductivity, especially for these quasar one dimensional systems, not only for the two dimensional systems, because it has been predicted theoretically, uh, especially in 2010, that if you have finite one dimensional spin chains, which are coupled to an S-wave superconductor, which simultaneously exhibits a large spin orbit coupling, then you can actually get a topological superconducting phase. Why is that? Basically, uh, when you create such a spin chain, the uh, in-gap states, these are the so-called Yushiba-Rusinov states of individual magnetic atoms interacting with the superconductor will hybridize and form a one-dimensional Shiba band. And, uh, Basically, uh, if you have uh, the right combination of these magnetic editing systems and the superconducting substrate, you can enter a non-trivial topological phase with a non-trivial band topology and a gapped phase here inside, uh, in the bulk, so to say, of this uh, chain. But at the ends, you must have boundary modes. This is in analogy to topological insulators. You must have boundary modes if you want to from a topological non-trivial to a trivial uh, phase and uh, so at the ends of these uh, 1D uh, chains you expect uh, to have zero energy modes highly localized at the ends and of course zero energy mode should be detectable in the local density of states as a function of energy. So these were predictions, here are some of the references here and uh, uh, so we have in the past uh, uh, looked at such systems uh, and uh, uh, clearly we found, and this is also reproduced by simulations, that it is decisive to have a large spin-orbit coupling parameter which is denoted alpha here. 
If you have zero spin-orbit coupling, then you do not have uh, the possibility to open up this topological gap. Only if you have finite spin-orbit coupling, uh, you might uh, open this topological gap, and uh, then you can create these end states. And these end states then are the famous zero. Uh, energy modes or Majorana modes, which hold great promise for topological quantum computation. Now, in the past, uh, and this is a short summary of our previous work in the field, we have created uh, as a first group worldwide uh, bottom up designed one dimensional spin chains. Uh, in this case, here with the helical spin texture, these uh, were iron chains which were grown on uh, or fabricated on superconducting medium 001, where we first, where we first observe a signature here of uh, Majorana end states and zero energy. We went further to manganese chains uh, on superconducting niobium, and this is a plot where we have here the spatial coordinate as a function of energy. We also can clearly see the zero energy modes at the ends of the chain, clearly separated from the finite energy trivial Shiva bands. We even determined the non uh, trivial topological band structure of manganese chains on niobium reported two years ago. And in collaboration with Stefan Rahl's group at the University of Melbourne, we have shown that in the case where you have multi orbit Shiva states, you can have also unconventional types of spatial distribution of Majorana states, in particular so called side features, which are observed experimentally and extremely nicely reproduced theoretically. This was a paper which appeared last year. But now uh, let me go uh, for the system I just introduced. So uh, the uh, question is can we uh, basically get uh, these zero energy modes uh, uh, and uh, simultaneously have a very robust nature of these modes, in particular for robust topological quantum computing applications? And so let me introduce now iron atoms in proximity now to the system I just introduced. This one, silver 2, uh, on the silver on niobium. And you see immediately you really need atomic scale characterization to understand the physics. The first point is if you have an iron atom on a surface you might have different absorption sites. For instance here this red atom here in the schematics uh, is sitting on a hollow side here, three-fourth coordinate hollow side, whereas this blue atom here is actually sitting on a bridge side here. You learn this, of course, in surface physics. And you see in the topography there is not a great difference between these iron atoms sitting on different absorption sites. But if you look at the electronic structure, if you record uh, differential tunneling conductance being a measure of the density of states as a function of energy, you first of all see that uh, the bismuth silver 2 alloy is indeed superconducting. You see here a gray spectrum with the two coherence peaks and of course a hard gap here. And if you then measure above these two different iron atoms, you see a gray difference in the spectrum. The iron atoms on the bridge side, actually, and this is the blue spectrum here corresponding to that atom, shows basically uh, a pair of uh, Shiva states here. You know, which appear at finite energy. And this is usually what you get. You get pair-wise uh, uh, appearances of whole and electron-like uh, states here uh, as a result of uh, uh, Cooper pair breaking by the magnetic impurity. However, for the iron atom sitting on this uh, hollow side, uh, you have a single peak, at least at the measurement temperature here, which is 4.5 Kelvin. It appears to be a single peak, uh, but it is not a single peak. Uh, it's just not resolved uh, here at this particular temperature. You would have to go to much lower temperature. However, it is favorable to start with uh, Shiva state located basically at firm energy. Because if you then hybridize uh, these Shiva atoms to form a Shiva band, it naturally uh, occurs already close to the Fermi level, and then that's favorable to open up a topological gap then inside that Shiva band. Moreover, 
you can characterize the spatial nature of these states. And again, uh, it's not only the extremely high energy resolution, notice this is an energy scale of minus 2 electron volts up to 2 electron volts, but you can combine this with atomic scale spatial resolution. So you can really look at the different iron atoms here at the different adsorption sites and look at the distribution in the spectroscopic map, map of uh, these Shiba states. And you see immediately that uh, there are iron atoms uh, where you basically have uh, no features in the surrounding and these are the iron atoms sitting on the bridge sites whereas the other kind of iron atoms exhibit a long-range nature of these Shiva states here uh, clearly and uh, uh, the extension is up to 10, sometimes 50 nanometers you basically see here very nice one mechanical interference between basically Shiba states of uh, uh, these different kind of Shiba impurities. And again, this is favorable because if you have a long range nature of the Shiba states, these Shiba impurities can couple much more easily over large distances. So in order to create a system exhibiting Majorana modes, this is exactly what you want to have. If you want to start uh, with states being close to further level and you want to have a large extension of those states. And it happens for this system that both of these requirements are fulfilled for the iron atoms sitting on the hollow sites. And so the conclusion is you should use those sites. But now you must have the atomic scale control to position all the atoms now on these hollow sites, step by step. And you can do it by single atom manipulation, and this is shown here. So we absorb iron atoms from the gas phase onto the surface here, and then basically uh, we use single atom manipulation techniques to create then a pair of three iron atoms in a row, up to, in this case, nine atoms. Of course, we went further, uh, but uh, I'm just uh, sticking now uh, to chains up to nine iron atoms. In this case, uh, the separation is three atomic lattice spacings, and in this case, uh, this makes up a distance of 1.5 nanometers, which appears to be a large distance uh, uh, compared, of course, to the interatomic distance. However, uh, as we just learned, uh, the extension of the Shiva states is much larger by a factor of 10. So we should not worry about this large distance. Uh, later on, I will show you a smaller distance for ships. And now let's have a look uh, to the spectroscopic data. And this is the beauty really of this technique. So you can go now from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 atoms. And you can record data where you have here basically now energy and here basically uh, uh, the position of the atoms, meaning the spatial coordinates. Here for a single atom, you see here the single feature of the Shiba state you have seen before in a color-coded fashion here, light yellow. And you see here basically the signatures of the coherence peaks of the superconducting this with silver two substrate. If you have a pair of iron atoms, now you see immediately that the Shiva state becomes split in energy. You clearly see the splitting. And this is the proof that these Shiva atoms are interacting. Otherwise, you would not get the splitting. If the atoms are too far away, of course, uh, they do not see each other uh, by any type of interaction. And so this is a clear proof of interaction. So now, if you go further and further here, uh, for three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine iron atoms, you see actually that the splitting develops into a gap, a clearly um, observable gap here uh, in the Shiba band here. However, at the ends, and, and this uh, shows up extremely nicely now, if you grow large and larger chains, uh, uh, this topological gap disappears and you basically get a single feature at the ends of the chains. And so if we go now from a single spatial coordinate to both spatial coordinates here, you see now, here's the topography of the chain, and if you go from the spectroscopic maps now into different energies, this is basically a Fermi level map, here of our sample, you see now that at the Fermi level you get beautifully these end states, this enhanced low density of states just at the end atom sites. And if you go away uh, from Fermi level at the energy of the Shiva bands here, then we basically see the bulk mode here and uh, very much reduced intensity. 
see basically no intensity here uh, at the ends. And this is of course a wonderful agreement with the early theoretical prediction going back to Kitaev. Kitaev in 2001 considered a one-dimensional p-wave superconductor and he considered uh, various situations where the coupling between neighboring sites uh, in comparison to the chemical potential of the system is either large or small. And in the regime, basically, where this coupling is large, he uh, extracted uh, uh, from his theory that there can be these end modes here, uh, which are, uh, of course, assigned to them, these uh, Majorana end modes here. And uh, in addition, then, you have uh, the bulk states, of course, of this Kitaev chain. And uh, if you compare this uh, to what is observed here experimentally, you find wonderful agreement. Now, of course, we have not only started this system, uh, now we have created numerous chains, otherwise I would not report on this today. Uh, so, for instance, if you now uh, go for a chain with only two atomic lattice spacings, and this is a, a, a separation of one nanometer, you see probably even more clearly that if you go from the single atom here all the way up to nine atoms or so, uh, you see here basically the opening of this topological gap. Here, of course, at 4.5k, uh, there is some broadening. Uh, currently, we take data at uh, 300 millikelvin where the situation is even more clear. Uh, and you see clearly, however, that this topological gap is closed towards uh, the ends of the chain. And this then corresponds to the situation at Fermi level, where you have clearly these end states very much localized here at, um, um, uh, the, uh, at the boundaries, basically between the chain and the superconducting disk of silver tube. Now, once you have achieved that, you can really uh, do uh, a lot of nice experiments uh, as predicted by a theory. Uh, you can, of course, span such a quasar one dimensional system, and this is basically the minimal number of atoms which you need to represent a bent uh, wire. Uh, and you see here the topography of such an open uh, bent wire. And again, you have still the end states uh, as it uh, is expected from theory. However, if you then add one single atom to close the loop, then there is no end state anymore. So the state that disappears. And this is, of course, what is expected for uh, basically a closed one dimensional system. You might then basically do other kind of experiments which have been proposed for these ring-like structures, for instance, applying in plane fields, but I don't have time to go into that. It just gives you uh, a nice demonstration what is uh, possible with physical atom manipulation techniques. In the end, uh, I will now switch the topic uh, because I would like to demonstrate that the general approach which I I'm focusing on today is actually uh, interesting in many other kind of directions of superconductivity research. Of course, as you all know, heavy fermion superconductors were very exciting fields uh, several decades ago. And uh, these days, actually, uh, the main question is, can we bring this field forward by an artificial materials design of uh, systems like condo lattices, heavy fermion systems interface with superconducting substrates where you can basically have a switchable superconducting state. And so the idea is to uh, create novel kind of hybrid systems. Hybrid systems, first of all, of condo lattices and heavy fermion systems with superconductors. Now you all know that if you have a magnetic impurity in, on a uh, in a normal metal host, you can have, of course, condor physics and in bulk systems, if you have a statistical distribution of these condor impurities, you know that the resistance goes up towards uh, zero temperature in contrast to a normal metal or to a superconductor. And uh, if you do spectroscopic measurements, of course, you can see a condor resonance or up because of pseudo resonance uh, close to the Fermi level, which, for instance, has been seen nicely also in sp scanning tonic spectroscopy in, in the late 90s. <laughs> now, if you have an array of condor impurities here under favorable conditions, you might be able to create a coherent 
uh, letter state, and uh, then this coherent uh, letter state, especially if you have then uh, lanthanides here, you might uh, even create a heavy fermion band, which is then hybridizing with a light band of conduction electrons, and uh, typically what you uh, see is then the opening of a gap, a so-called hybridization gap, if you clearly have uh, uh, such hybridization going on between the individual condo impurities. Now this kind of physics has been observed by scanning tonic spectroscopy by two groups uh, of Ali Yazdani and Charles Davis uh, uh, on surfaces of bike systems uh, like cerium cobalt 5 and they have cleaved these crystals and due to the complex crystal structure of course you will get different surface terminations and uh, indeed the spectroscopic signatures of these different planes are slightly different. However, we have clearly seen what is expected, namely this hybridization gap. But the problem is, once you have synthesized a certain crystal, there is no way to tune the properties anymore. So you can have magnetically ordered or superconducting heavy fermion systems, for instance. But once you have a certain crystal type, there is not much space to tune the system. And this is the idea, of course, uh, what I would like to show you at the very end now of my talk. Uh, so also in this field now, we create another kind of hybrid systems, namely two-dimensional thin films of very well-known condom letters and heavy fermion systems, like lanthanum cerium uh, alloys, uh, which are very well-known as condom alloy systems, right uh, back uh, uh, from the early 70s. The system has been studied as a bulk material. However, uh, in our case now, we will grow a, a two-dimensional uh, alloy on top of a superconductor. And of course, uh, by proximity to a superconductor, you are able then again to induce uh, superconductivity in these systems. So you might be able to study the interaction of condo uh, physics and superconductivity in a very nice way. Yeah, I'm just finishing now. So uh, basically what we have uh, done is we have prepared an atomically clean substrate here of rhenium. Uh, we checked, of course, that we have a very pronounced superconducting gap of uh, rhenium. And then you can grow basically first the lanthanum layer. It gives a wedding layer on the rhenium. You then deposit cerium and yield the system and you can create a very nice uh, two-dimensional alloy. And then shown here, you can get really beautiful growth of such islands of ordered land of cerium. If you first put the part of cerium, you just get clusters of cerium on the rhenium, simply because cerium is not wedding rhenium. This is also something you learn in surface physics. You see immediately that uh, the electronic structure is greatly modified, no matter if you grow the land uh, and wedding layer or grow these uh, serum clusters, you have a, a drastically changed electronic structure with respect to the rhenium substrate. And now what you see here, uh, that you really get a very well-ordered uh, structure of this lanthanum serum alloy. There are still some vacancies here due to the fact that it is not a closed layer of serum here. But if you zoom in, you see this is raw data of a very nice atomic resolution here uh, of this uh, serum lanthanum alloy. The serum is basically sitting on top of three lanthanum atoms, so it's three-fold coordinated, and the lanthanum is sitting on the rhenium. And now if you look at the spectroscopy of this lanthanum serum alloy first in the normal state of rhenium, we see here clearly the opening of a gap here. And uh, we zoom in uh, in energy uh, here to uh, about minus 42, plus 40 million electron volts. And we see clearly here uh, the signatures of a hybridization gap on the order of 20 million electron volt. We can check by doing line spectroscopy that this hybridization gap is uh, very nicely homogeneous across the alloy. And now in the end, of course, the fun is that you can switch on superconductivity of the substrate, and this is done here. So below the temperature now, below the TC of rhenium, and you see the opening of yet another gap, which is much smaller here, uh, on top of the hybridization gap. And if you zoom in into even smaller energy window of minus uh, one up to plus one milli electron volt, we see 
that there is yet another interesting feature, namely a Shiba band inside this superconducting gap. And this means that the condor screening, though we are in a strong coupling condor regime, as we, as we show here in this uh, recently submitted publication, uh, we do not have a complete screening of uh, these magnetic impurities, so uh, there are residual moments left which are then giving rise to uh, subgap Shiba bands. And you can very nicely then study the interaction between Shiba physics, condor physics, and the superconductivity. And of course, uh, you can imagine uh, we are now studying basically the different situations where you have different ratios of the gap sizes of this hybridization gap and the superconducting gap. And uh, we have here a very versatile platform for studying microscopic aspects of exotic one states in artificially designed superconducting F electron materials. So I don't have time to touch upon other systems if you are interested in. Uh, we recently have publications where we designed again in a bottom-up approach topological nodal point superconductors by creating basically anti-magnetic uh, manganese ions uh, on niobium where we have different types of edges, ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic edges, which behave differently. It's a very nice collaboration, again, with the groups of Dirk Moore and Stefan Rache. Or we can create uh, non-collinear spin textures, like spin spiral states, in normal kind of hybrids, like iron monolayers, on superconducting tantalum 110, you so you see, uh, we are making use of all these elemental superconductors. This shows a nice spin polarized STM image with the spiral phase. You have a period of about six nanometers of the spiral phase. And it's predicted by Nagarosa and co-works about 10 years ago already that uh, this gives rise to P-wave superconductivity in such systems. So there's a lot of things you can do. And of course, ultimately, the goal is really to make a bottom-up design of a high TC superconductor in quasi two dimensional magnet superconductor hybrid systems. This is a, a longer term goal of these kind of investigations. We basically prepare two dimensional magnetic layers with antiferromagnetic ordering, like the manganese layers on niobium, for instance, and other kind of systems, where we decouple now the magnetic layers uh, to have very strong uh, antiferromagnetic spin fluctuations. We have already seen that experimentally. And of course, if we proximity couple this to a superconductor, we might be able to see basically a possible enhancement of BCS superconductivity by non-electron phonon mechanism. So we really would like to go into the fundamentals of uh, transition temperature enhancement, uh, uh, for instance, by spin fluctuations. And of course, we are looking for any uh, model Hamiltonian which can, as a minimum model, which can describe such enhancement. And the beauty is that for any type of model Hamiltonian, we can really experimentally realize this by advanced nanotechnology. And so we have great perspectives, really, for theory guided quantum materials design. With that, I would like to end. I would like to thank my co-workers first from the experimental side, Ron Kim, who started this field several years back in time with the iron systems of aluminium. Lukas Schneider, Kai Tontag, Jens Wiebe, who did a very nice work for the manganese chains, especially on the niobium, and uh, more recently now for the uh, silver uh, bismuth alloys. They went to also are doing up initial calculations, Tori Post, uh, contributing greatly to tide line uh, model calculations. Ted Moore in Chicago and uh, Stefan Rachel in Melbourne contributed in particular uh, for the iron and aluminium systems as well as uh, more recently also for the condor alloy systems interface to superconductors. And so with that, I would like to end here and thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you very much for these amazing experimental results towards atomic control of topological matter. We have time for a few questions. You guys, for you first. Thank you very much for your motivating presentation and persistent work. Very specific question to the your one key chain which you suggest embedded in a circular chain. Have you already performed this experiment? And this is only a uh, prediction. And second, in uh, such a band, this one dimensional chain uh, of small radius, the interactions uh, between different pairs becomes specially 
as I thought. And will this effect enhance the uh, expected result or what the opposite to suppress? Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this question. I uh, addressed just uh, one example uh, because of a limited time. We have created various kind of model systems. Already you see it here, but indeed this was uh, an example of a system where we have an extremely small, probably the smallest possible radius. We have also constructed systems with large radii, but you can see even in the situation of an extremely small radius, uh, that basically the inner sides here show no state density at all at Fermi level, only the end sides. Yeah? And this is uh, exactly observed also now uh, for uh, uh, open uh, rings now where we have large radii. Uh, but here in principle you should uh, observe uh, uh, the kind of effects probably mostly if they would uh, uh, show up. However, what is clear is you have to make sure that all the iron atoms sit on equivalent sides. And uh, but you see uh, that uh, due to this, uh, yeah, uh, boundary condition, uh, you have indeed sometimes maybe a little bit of different spacing here. And, uh, um, but nevertheless, uh, the physics, of course, what you expect is robust. Yeah, it's uh, not depending on small details. It depends, however, on the major details, and the major details is you should have uh, always the reproducible Shiva state, which you only get if you make sure that all the iron atoms are sitting on equivalent sides. If you would have one atom sitting on the red side, then this physics is no longer observable. You just see atomic-like Shiva state physics. You don't see the coherence of your system. Yeah, and uh, this is the major difference. So we need atomic scale control to show the beautiful physics as predicted by theory. Thank you. So I'm sure there is a lot of more questions, but I'm sorry, I would like to ask you to approach the speaker directly in the break. Uh, we are already over time. Thank you very much. <laughs>